Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. To this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. And before we continue with tonight's show, a brief programming note. Beginning with the next week's episode, so when you hear this, this episode will release on Monday, January 1st, 2024, so our following week, the week starting Sunday, January 7, you may be used to our Monday release schedule. We're going to start releasing episodes on Tuesdays instead of Mondays, uh, just to give us a little more time to edit and get everything polished up before we post. So we'll continue to record Sunday nights as normal, and we will just move the posting date one day ahead to, or one day behind rather, to Tuesdays moving forward. So our episode after this one will release on Tuesday, January 9, and you can expect that moving forward. So thank you as always for listening and viewing the Blue Security Podcast and on with tonight's show. Tonight we have some good stuff lined up. I found an article by one of our Microsoft MVPs named Rue Campbell. And he published his blog called Common M365 Security Mistakes, and one of them is on PIM, which is Privileged Identity Management. And in this one, he goes through several things that customers or users of M365 who use Privileged Identity Management might have some mistakes or misconceptions about how it works. And so we're going to walk through some of them during the show. The first one is something that Adam and I have talked about frequently when it comes to configuring MFA. So when you configure MFA within PIM, there's an option to say require Azure MFA when you activate a PIM role. And so privilege identity management, if you're not familiar with it, it is a feature of Entra ID Plan 2 or EMS E5 or ME5 Security or ME5 Complete Suite. And it allows you to have just-in-time activation of privileged roles. And so when you configure these roles, there's certain options. One of them is to require MFA. When you do that, the claim for the MFA, if you're within the Microsoft ecosystem gets passed to Azure. And so it doesn't require you to redo the MFA token. So the user behavior, if you have this configured and you're within the Microsoft suite, say you're using the Microsoft Authenticator or conditional access with MFA or Windows Hello for Business on a managed machine, so on and so forth, that MFA token will get satisfied the claim requirement will get passed through and m365 will say yes they satisfied the mfa we don't need to re-mfa them that is a good thing for users because they're not constantly getting prompted and that claim gets continually satisfied when i deployed this at another organization when we were using okta the experience was a little bit different because we used okta to mfa the authentication to M365 or Azure required the MFA. And then when you activate it and you required Azure MFA, it would then prompt again for the MFA within the Microsoft Authenticator. So the first one was when the Okta Verify app, and then the second one was in the Microsoft Authenticator app. That does exactly what we want in this case, which is pretty much to require a secondary MFA. I think that's what most people think in their minds. But if you're within the Microsoft ecosystem, you're not going to get that behavior. And the reason is, is because that claim gets passed through and it's already done. So great for users. It's also susceptible to token theft or replay because that token continually gets passed. So it's not doing the thing that you might think that you want it to do. So some mitigations, you can set a lower sign in frequency. I wouldn't do it super low, but to a point where you feel is comfortable for risk. Do not allow persistent sessions. And again, this is for privileged roles. So think of it like your global administrator, your exchange on online administrator, not necessarily regular users when they're doing things. 
And then the blog, Rue Campbell here, does talk about using IP-based location requirements while blocking others. You can do that. Like, let's say you want to require a global admin to be within one of your company egress IPs. You can do that as well as a mitigation. But I would recommend doing something like a managed device or intra internet access if you're looking at network-based conditional access. So some mitigations there, just a little misconception about how MFA works in this case. Yeah, this is a great, we're off to a great start here discussing passing those existing MFA claims. And that is by design. The idea is unless you explicitly configure it otherwise, if a user has recently satisfied an MFA requirement, like you said, through using the authenticator app, signing in with Windows Hello for Business, behavior is not to prompt them again. And this is intentional. So if you want to do that, Andy, you talk about really the best way to do it is using that sign-in frequency. Now, a couple of things on my soapbox here, or actually not on my soapbox, rather. So I usually get on my soapbox about sign-in frequency and say, don't use it or use it very sparingly. I also say things like, and Andy does too, don't use IP-based restrictions. Don't rely on them for security. Two things here. Number one, if there was ever a use case where sign-in frequency is appropriate, this is one of them. I wholeheartedly agree that administrative privileged roles should have to sign in frequently and revalidate their credentials. We don't want our rank and file to do it, because it creates MFA fatigue, it creates credential fatigue, and leads to higher risk of phishing. Hopefully, your administrators are a little better at spotting phishing attempts than your run-of-the-mill users, and that risk is a little mitigated just through their advanced technical knowledge. So, okay with sign-in frequency for that. The other one, I don't like not asking for MFA based on your IP location, that is clearly not a zero trust principle, but using IP-based location as one of many conditions that you must satisfy to become an administrator is a whole different concept. If I'm going to require managed device, multi-factor authentication, uh, using a PAW or a SAW, if I want to throw in IP-based location as yet another checkbox, that's great by all means. Just don't rely on it as a substitute for multi-factor authentication. That's where we get on our soapbox about it. But if you want to layer that in as yet another condition, that's fantastic. That's great. It just shouldn't be your only one. Great call out. There's a big difference there. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. So we talked about how when I was working at another company and Okta Verify was the first authenticator, then Microsoft Authenticator was the second one. Now, what if I wanted to force an MFA reprompt within the Microsoft ecosystem? We just talked about how that MFA claim gets passed, and so you won't get prompted. But let's say you do want to do that. There is something new called authentication context, and this is something that is great, and people should be taking advantage of it within their conditional access. What it does is it forces another conditional access policy Normally within conditional access policies, it's only done at the time of authentication. So it's that first authentication, you get prompted and you have to satisfy all these conditions. Authentication context is a way to apply another conditional access policy once you're in the cloud app after authentication. So for example, if I authenticate to M365, Azure, and then I want to access another thing, say, for example, privilege identity management in this case, I can then force another conditional access policy to be satisfied. In that case, I can say require MFA again. If I want to just do basic MFA, I could require authentication strength and say that I want it to be a FIDO2 authenticator or security key must be that. Or I can enforce the use of a paw or saw through a filtered device, I can also require a third-party MFA solution. Let's say you're a semantic VIP or duo customer. You can then use that as an authentication context. And a little bit on a tangent here, but still related, if you're requiring, say, FIDO2 key, you know, one of the things that could be an attack vector would be if 
you have an attacker that registers a new FIDO2 key without any type of other conditions to do that. So if you're requiring FIDO2, it would behoove you to have conditional access policies, more security measures when registering a new FIDO2 security key as well. So those are a couple of things. And when you do that, there is something within PIM to then edit each role. So say, for example, you want to apply authentication context to global admin. You go into PIM, select the role, edit the role, and there's a option called on activation. And then there's a drop down box that requires a few things. You can have it require nothing. You can have it require Azure MFA, which we just talked about is different. And then finally, you can have it require Microsoft Entra conditional access. You have to have conditional access authentication context things configured. And we just went through a bunch of different examples of those things. And you can select that thing to then re-up or step up your MFA or whatever it is that you're trying to do within the context of that cloud app. So this is a great way to provide more security after authentication for certain conditions that you want to satisfy. A lot of great ideas here. The one I will plug, I would love for all of your privileged roles to require a FIDO2 security key. I think the investment in this is for most enterprises, the change you find in the couch cushions to go supply FIDO2 keys to all your admins and force them to use them for every single sign in. Now you have true fish resistance and a lot of attack vectors simply go away. This would be the right approach to do. And this Andy just walked you through how to configure it. So authentication contexts are relatively new. Andy, as you were verbally walking through configuring PIM for the role, I remember when it was just a checkbox, require Azure MFA. And so now you do explain that's now a drop down, and the authentication contexts are also an option. So that's a, a relatively recent change within the last year or so uh, to PIM, and that additional capability is fantastic. Now, to be fair, we still <laughs> keep reporting metrics all the time that there is a very high percentage of privileged roles that don't even require MFA at all. If you have to start there, start there, but this is your North Star. The next one I want to talk about briefly is requiring approval to activate. And this can get into some questions, so I kind of wanted to see what your thoughts are on it, Adam, as we talk through it. But when you require approval to activate things, there is certainly sometimes customers can overuse it like for the simple things, like if you want to create an M365 group, you might need approval, or you want to view a billing statement, you're going to need approval. You want to release an email from quarantine, you need approval. These are simple tasks that probably don't need approval in order to do that. And so if you're using PIM, think about what you want to scope approval in. If you underuse it, and this is kind of where over permissioning admins can come into play, like you want to say, allow a level one service desk person who wants to use PIM to get global admin in God mode within Azure, and you just allow them to do that with no approval, that's also probably not the right way to use it. So I think, you know, there's some questions as I'm thinking about how I would do it in a greenfield atom. Would I require admins to not have any standing access to admin roles? That's not how I did it previously, but would I have available roles that require them to PIM and maybe no approval to do that and just require certain authentication context to be satisfied? And then maybe for the highly sensitive ones, require approval? Or would you still have standing access to things and not require them to do that from day to day? Like you could get really granular, like require them to activate it for eight hours for a specific role, you know, an hour for another role and so on and so forth and really dial it in. But I was thinking, you know, one way to be really safe is to not have any standing access, but there's other things that we can protect too, like, on the authentication side, right? Like require a managed device and all this other stuff. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on if you were to do it in a greenfield, how you would kind of think about doing it? 
and I put on my hat from when I was an M365 system owner and, and administrator, owned the Exchange Online environment and, and dabbled in some SharePoint Online as well. I have often advocated for using PIM as a way to do just enough access, just enough privilege, because you can make multiple roles available to people. So I know, hey, if I need to go do this role, I'll just wear this hat. And I've often articulated that that can protect you from yourself. If you kick off a PowerShell script that does something bad and you only, you know, privileged up to just the role you need, you can limit the blast radius of something going wrong. And it could just be just an accident, but accidents happen. However, I think generally us as humans, we will take the path of least resistance. So although I agree in theory as if I'm an administrator and I, I want to do the right thing and use just enough privilege and all that, but if I can go straight to global admin and I don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops, maybe I'm just going to do that, you know? So I think if you create like a hierarchy of how much work I have to jump through to move to each role and it grows with the amount of privilege the role has, now you've created an incentive to right size your role selection as you elevate. Because if elevating to global admin is a hassle and it darn well should be, then I'm going to go pick this role because it doesn't require an approval chain for that. And now I'm more incented to right size, which I think day to day delivers more administrative and security benefit than does over, like you said, requiring too many approvals. I've often art articulated that I'm in favor of no standing access just because I don't find the PIM process onerous. If I'm an administrator and I know generally like today, I'm going to work in Intune today. I can go wear the Intune administrator hat. I'm going to allow me to do it for eight hours, like no big deal. That's not going to crush me to spend the two minutes upping my privilege there and, and going through the activation process. So I'd say really, I don't see a need to have standing access just because it can be so quick to go through the privilege activation, the role activation, I should say. So I, I would say you, you do approvals, like you said, conservatively. And if you, if you do it right, you create natural incentives for admins to do roles that are just enough privilege. If you've designed it correctly, if you've designed it incorrectly, either they will just jump straight to the highest privilege role they can, which we may not want, or if we make it too onerous, then they may just design a way around it entirely, which also is problematic. You know, you get almost like shadow it, but shadow administration instead. So yep. um, it's, it's all about fit and, and right size and kind of the Goldilocks problem, but you'll know when you're in the right place and your admins will definitely give you feedback on that. Cause admins always grumble about this, taking so much of their time and being such a hassle. And it's just not unless you make it that way, but a simple activation without a long approval process is two minutes and it's not a big deal. Yeah. I think you, said it perfectly well so when you look at an approval process for different roles one of the things that you also need to look at is mitigation against role lockout so let's say adam and i are both eligible for global admin and he is the only other person or maybe adam and my boss is the third person and adam and the and our boss are the two people who could approve me to become global admin and Adam is sick for the day, doesn't have access to his computer. My boss is on vacation and removed email from his phone as we all should. So mm -hmm. no one's getting pinged. And now I need to elevate to global admin for a task and no one is there to approve it. And so that is a situation you can run into when you start using the approval method. And so you got to have a game plan and mitigate against this. And usually there is a break glass account that is protected against all other conditional access policies. You want it to be 
extremely long password. You want it to be highly monitored, alert on any time it's used. And so if you have that break glass account, that would be the case to probably use it when you need to do a business critical thing and elevate and no one is there to uh, approve that process. So break glass accounts are a whole other topic. There's actually really good documentation from Microsoft on best practices for break glass accounts, but you do want to have one that is completely excluded from conditional access policies and have that password stored safely. So another thing that can be a big mistake if you accidentally lock out your admins once you have that approval role in place and don't have anyone to approve. Good call out. I mean, you got to plan for it and you got to have a backup plan to the backup plan and figure out ways you're going to do it. And, and ultimately, probably the fallback is that break glass. And that's where you notify your monitoring team. Hey, you're going to get lit up like a Christmas tree here. I know it. I have to use this. And here's why. Um, and, and we'll go on with it, you know? And, and so as long as you plan for everything, you'll be okay. And, and ultimately you probably, your flow chart gets pretty quick to just use the break glass if that happens, because otherwise you will always find some edge case that you didn't plan for, but that, that makes sense. And, and that works out really well. And, you know, you can learn and adjust from it as well. If you stuck around to the end, you're going to be rewarded because this one is a doozy. As I read through this blog, I learned something about how to do PIM. And so this is this last one is an amazing piece of advice for those who are using PIM already or think about using it. If you want to protect non-Entra, non-Azure resources, you can with Privilege Identity Management. Traditionally, up until maybe about a year ago or so, PIM was used for Azure roles. So built-in Azure roles like Global Administrator, Exchange Online Administrator, Cloud Device Admin, you know, so on and so forth. Any role that was available within Azure, you could PIM up to, essentially. There was something that was added recently called... Um, PIM for groups, which was previously known as privileged access groups. And it was implemented a little bit differently, but now it's pretty seamlessly integrated within PIM. And there are roles, even within Microsoft, the whole suite, that aren't available to PIM traditionally. Like, for example, in Defender XDR, there's RBAC roles and there's custom roles. And within Exchange, there's RBAC roles like recipient management or view only organization management. So if you're familiar with the exchange online, there's roles on the back end. Purview roles are another one. E-discovery manager, Azure information protection super user, which can read anything or decrypt anything that's sensitively labeled. You can decrypt it with the super user permissions. And so those are big roles that aren't included in PIM. And so if you want to do that, or even roles within non-Microsoft apps like your ERP systems or your HR system, CRM, other business apps. As long as they're SaaS apps that have the ability to be federated with Entra ID and you can provision security groups back and forth, then you can use PIM to elevate or activate different roles within those apps. And so to do this, you would assign an M365 or security group the role so that anyone in the group would get that permission. So I tested this with something that I had done previously with Azure Governance ID. One of the biggest issues was becoming a device administrator on an Entra joined device, the cloud device. And so that role exists but it was difficult to grant users that and doing it through PIM was kind of a pain and you could do it through governance ID. But if you do it through a group, it's actually very seamless. You assign a cloud device administrator role to the group. When you create the group, you have to check the box that says allow Azure roles to be assigned to this. And of course you can do this with any app and once the group is created, then you activate it within PIM to say, I want this to be visible within PIM and to be 
able to be uh, eligible for users to be assigned to. And so it's really easy. Once you have that configured, then you can assign a user to be eligible or active within the group itself. And once you're in the group, you get the permissions for the role that it was assigned to. And you can have the access to the group get expired after a certain time if you want and so on and so forth or approval as we talked about here. So it's super powerful and it really opens up PIM to not only use Azure roles, but for any SaaS app, for any privileged role, you can use PIM to accomplish it. So I thought this was a light bulb when I read through this because I mean, there's so many different SaaS apps that, you know, CRM, Salesforce is a big one, right? Like for using Salesforce or um, Power BI uh, or uh, Dynamics is another one, right? So Dynamics 365 has its own user permissions on the inside, different roles. And you could, the, the sky's the limit, honestly, when it comes to this. And so like if you can assign a role to a group and anyone in that group gets the role, you can use PIM to activate membership to that group. So it's super seamless, really powerful, and it really opens up like privileged identity just in time management for any SaaS app. I think you and I both tried entitlement management and we were able to make it work for those intra join devices and getting administrative privilege on them. But this is way better because you get all the benefits of what's built into PIM as far as, like we talked about, approval flows, authentication context. Uh, we, we didn't really talk about it here, but um, access reviews are, are there as well. And so you get all of that goodness that's really designed around privileged roles. And now you can use it to manage hey, plug this person in the group for eight hours, then yank them out and don't put them in until this person signs off on it. And every quarter, ask this person to revalidate who should even have the ability to request this role. Um, all those things are built in. You get them automatically. And now you can extend it to all of those other solutions. Another one in the Microsoft ecosystem you didn't mention, Andy, Insider Risk Management has its own permissioning as well because, again, like you talked about with the information protection piece, super sensitive. If I could decrypt any document in the whole company and I work for, you know, Coca-Cola, I can go decrypt the Coca-Cola recipe. If I work for KFC, I can go decrypt, you know, the secret blend of herbs and spices. Like the sky's the limit. That's an incredibly privileged role. This would be a really good idea to have a ton of approval around it and uh, very strict revalidation, maybe monthly uh, and, and all that goodness. And that's all built in here. So really, I... I dabbled with this a little bit, but I think even to me, I, it didn't click just how much you could use this for. Like you said, sky's the limit. So uh, our listeners and viewers who stayed till the end were definitely rewarded. Great stuff tonight. Yeah, and it's really comes down to those roles that you probably have or need access to very rarely. Like, for example, the Azure Information Protection Super User. When... I had deployed information protection at a previous company. It recommends that you configure some super users because at some point at some e-discovery thing or whatever, you're going to have to decrypt a document of some sort, but that's not something you use on a daily basis. But because we didn't have this capability, we just set three people as standing Azure information protection, super users. Think which, of, think, speaking of no standing access, right? If there's ever something you want no standing access to. It's that. And, to your point, that was basically not possible to do that real time, just in time elevation. Yep. So really powerful. Think of all the different things that you have standing access to and how you can re not necessarily remove it, but reduce your risk and have ways, you know, through authentication contacts and approval chains to mitigate that if your account were to be compromised. And that's our show for this week. We're going to put a link to Rue Campbell's blog within the show notes. Really, really good. He's got screenshots within there for a lot of the ways this stuff is configured. I tested it myself and especially the last part there, and it was really good. So take a look at his blog and 
Thank you for listening and watching. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.